The Old Testament reading is taken from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal, and Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know what that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, Behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him, and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is taken from Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. After this, the Lord appointed 70, 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Garrett, carry no money bag, 
no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. That portion of God's Word that serves as the basis of our message this afternoon, both to you as a congregation and to Brother Tim, who awaits his installation, John 21, 15 through 17. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these do? Yes, Lord, he answered him. You know I love you. Feed my lambs, Jesus told him. He asked him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he answered him. You know I love you. Jesus told him, be a shepherd of my sheep. Simon, son of John, he asked him a third time, do you love me? He answered him, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus told him, feed my sheep. Here ends the text. What's for supper? My sainted grandfather would beller as he came crashing through the front door on the day of, after a, a full day of work or after playing several hands of gin rummy at the local club. What are we going to eat? My dear mother would inquire each time we announced that we were driving down to Harrisburg for a visit. Food is important to us. And in some cases, it often takes on the, the character of ritual or even institutional tradition, not to mention family tradition. Why, we, we always have such and such for Christmas. And we always have such and such for Easter. Uh, and we have so-and-so for somebody's birthday. Bratwurst. Turkey. And if you spend any time at all in Iowa, ham balls. Well, we could have a list of family traditions, couldn't we? I could talk about my mother's tagliarini. Anybody know what tagliarini even is? It's an Italian dish, and it had black olives and cheese, and that's all I remember, and boy, do I miss it. And boy, do I miss her apple pie. And each of us would have a list of family traditions and the good cooks in the family who would, uh, we'd just look forward to those kinds of meals. Well, do we live to eat, or do we eat to live? Well, perhaps it's a little of both. Now, just preceding the verses of this text, Jesus has prepared breakfast for some of the disciples. They had gone back to fishing. After all, they had to eat. Even in the aftermath of the resurrection and the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. They had fished all night and caught absolutely nothing nothing. At daybreak, Jesus stands on the shore and shouts out whether they have caught anything. Well, the answer, of course, is no. And then he gives them a simple suggestion. Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. 
And they did. And this is one of the few questions I missed on my New Testament test with, with one of the professors. You remember how many fish were in the net? I'll never forget it. Pastor, brother, pastors. 153. The charcoal fire already prepared. The fish is cooked. Jesus breaks bread with them amidst much wonderment on the part of the fishermen disciples. And as we look at the text, we see that there are three questions and three answers. Peter had denied Jesus how many times? His sin was absolved. But Jesus desired to instruct Peter further in order to commission him for the office which would be conferred on him. As Jesus indicated, even before his denial, and I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter, at, on that occasion, had spoken an important truth. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the faith which Peter there professed would indeed be the foundation of the church, the body of Christ on earth. But now Jesus is going to refine things with a probing question. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. You who are Greek exegetes among us, can take note of some instruction here. There are several Greek words which can be translated love. We all, we all know this. Jesus' question to Peter uses the word agape, which simply defined means godly love. But Peter's reply uses a different word, phileo, which is the term for brotherly love and affection, simply defined. And this pattern is repeated two more times. Agape, godly love, the question. Phileo, or philia, the answer. So after the third question, Peter is grieved. And he knew well the cause. He had formerly denied Jesus three times. But now something radical is different. Peter now knows that Jesus is fully the Christ and that Jesus also knows his heart. Lord, you know that I love you. Before God, who alone searches our hearts, you know those words. Some pastors, maybe a lot of us pastor guys, use them in private confession and absolution and preceding often home communion. Jesus is searching Peter's heart for Peter's benefit and finally for ours as one who will have charge over the flock of Christ. Peter would become a strong pastor proclaimer. He would feed Christ's lambs. He would feed his flock and he would feed his sheep. Peter received his call directly into the holy office from Christ. And following his breakdown of faith, he was reinstated. He will now care for those souls whom God gives him. He will care for the lambs and all those whose faith is yet unformed and immature. He will feed the whole flock in like manner as the good shepherd correcting guiding, snatching them from the brambles of sin and error, and setting them on his shoulder lovingly once again. His way with them will be like this. To feed the sheep is nothing but proclaiming the word of God that is true faith. Well, the pastor shepherd in these latter days is to do nothing different. He will do, above all, these things. He will love his sheep, the not so young and the not so old, 
and the little ones and the big ones and the in-between ones. Now, what shape will the shepherd's love take? Well, first of all, he'll tell them the truth, not some watered-down flabby concessions to the culture or reason-based entertainment philosophy. He will tell them the truth regarding the word, the commandments, the Holy Trinity, the sacraments, conversion, baptism, and all the other foundational truths of our most holy faith. He will not give them cotton candy. Save that for the fair. He'll give them the meat and potatoes and vegetables that alone give strength. And he will love his sheep as a faithful shepherd by leading them and guiding them in the right paths to the extent that he is able, especially by boldly proclaiming the sin-revealing law and persistently and lavishingly proclaiming the gospel, reassuring them of forgiveness and healing. And he will love and feed his flock by fending off the wolf, the subtle incursions of fad and culture, of entertainment values which blur or even obliterate right worship. He will stand and speak when others fear because they fear the opinions of men. He knows God's plans for his flock, which do not include bait and switch methods and syrupy appeals. He'll feed his sheep by loving them enough to identify and then remove the thorns of sin, which fester and infect his flock, all in the context of declaring the truth and purity of God's almighty, powerful, spirit-filled word as he speaks to them from this pulpit, from this altar, in the classroom, wherever. And he'll do this because Christ first loved him, an unworthy shepherd, imperfect and flawed, but upon whom God has placed the mantle of Elijah, the honor and privilege of feeding his sheep, loving them as Christ first loved him, feeding the lambs with the sincere milk of the word, feeding the sheep with the strengthening meat of law and gospel, and bringing them to Christ's banquet foretaste in the Lord's Supper. You congregation, he will seek to feed you the flock whom the good shepherd Jesus has given him to love and to teach and to protect, serving only the very best food, so that you may be strengthened in faith toward God and in more fervent love towards one another. He will seek to strengthen you for bringing others to hear about this excellent nourishment so that the flock might grow and flourish. He will feed you now in God's earthly pasture until God himself seats you at the Lamb's high feast in heaven with all the saints. Welcome, dear brethren. Feed the sheep well. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses our understanding keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus until life eternal. Amen.